Welcome to the Freedom or Bust podcast with Joelle and Natalie Rivera. You are here because you will accept nothing less than the freedom to determine your destiny, do what you love, and fulfill your life's purpose. We believe that self-employment is the ultimate form of empowerment, and our mission is to bring you guests whose powerful entrepreneurship stories and real-world advice will give you the inspiration and tools to create a business and life that you love. Today's guest is Jimmy Murray. Jimmy's educational journey was disrupted by a volatile home life. However, he persisted, went to college and studied everything from statistics to film to marketing. His career has taken an equally eclectic path with a variety of jobs, including being, as he calls, a bagel jockey, stand-up comedy, customer support, programming, and inevitably to entrepreneurship. In 2007, after burning all of his bridges and paying forward poor financial and life skills picked up in childhood, it all coalesced in a rapid period of decline, leading to a few too many pills, getting kicked out of his university, and ending up homeless. His period of homelessness was an awakening experience that further solidified his natural entrepreneurial inklings as he was forced to further develop his tenacity, resourcefulness, and radical personal responsibility. With his last $50, he turned his life around, taught himself coding and artificial intelligence, and today he's a voiceover artist and a self-proclaimed beast at content creation on all platforms. Jimmy brings humor into every aspect of his business and is dedicated to motivating people to believe that nothing is impossible. So welcome. It's uh, truly an honor to have you here with us. Uh, we're excited uh, because you truly have a transformational story uh, and your ability to, to really redefine yourself, I think is a powerful way for people to understand that they can also face challenges and then look at creating whatever life they want to create. I think with that blurb you just threw about threw out about me, I think uh, I think the interview's over. I think we mentioned everything we needed to hit. Uh, you did a fantastic <laughs> job. Uh, done. We're done. done. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, well, you were worthy of such an introduction. So, so let's get started taking a little bit more of a look at how that experience that I alluded to in the introduction kind of gave you a kickstart onto your path of entrepreneurship. So the first thing that we would like to know is now looking back at that experience, um, do you see any sort of deeper meaning or reason that it happened that led you to where you are today? So hitting back at your question, uh, there were like nine different things you mentioned that might've uh, contributed to my entrepreneurial click. Are you referring specifically to the, uh, the homelessness or the, the preceding events? Yes. Well, I'd say the homelessness experience, because I know from what you've shared previously, it was sort of a pivotal moment. Um, but really, it's however we want to take it. Where did it fit into your your uh, drive to be an entrepreneur? Did it, Were you an entrepreneur before that happened, or did that all come later? These are, and this part is of it is, is not just being an entrepreneur. It's really about being a creator. Because uh, obviously, you face all these challenges. You face all these different things. But at the end of the day, you became a creator because you do so many different things, like, and you're willing to just deep dive without fear and just put it out there. I know you just made a course and it's like, oh, I'm going to make a course in like 30 days. You just put it out there. And I think all those well, things you, are- you taught me to do that, Joe Hill. <laughs> <laughs> it's his fault. It's my fault. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Looking back and talking to my parents, they're like, yeah, you always had like this entrepreneurial drive. You just didn't know how to implement entrepreneurial talent. Like uh, I wanted to do this car wash and I presented like a business model to my grandfather, my father, my mom. They're like, that's, that's cool. But you know, people can get like a way more professional car wash than what you're offering. I'm like, oh, with, with the personal touch, not be, be like my, my value add or whatever. I didn't say value add when I was five years old, but that was, that was basically it. This, uh, this desire to make money, this desire to create. Uh, as, as I'm talking out loud, I'm remembering asking my mom, Hey, what, what's your favorite friend? And she was like, well, obviously Jennifer Aniston and, or, or Rachel. I'm like, I'm going to have you meet her someday. Cause I just <laughs> thought I, I, I just thought I was going to be this hotshot, uh, comedic talent down the line. This is as early, I guess it was 1996, 1997, you know, the second and third season of friends, uh, pivoting to the homeless moment that really drives a sense of you, you have to rely on yourself and you have to be extremely resourceful. And these are two talents that are extremely integral, extremely instrumental in 
in making yourself uh, an entrepreneur. Those are out of all the like 10 or 12 skills you need to be an entrepreneur, resourcefulness and self-reliance uh, are probably in the top two. Yeah. And I can really relate to, to a lot of your story because I see, I also grew up uh, in the struggle. I actually moved around sometimes every six months we we're moving somewhere else, you know, a lot of uncertainty. So how did you deal with the uncertainty in your life and how did you come to like embrace that uncertainty? So each bit of uncertainty brought with it a different strategy because it often was a different type of uncertainty. I, I immediately thought when you asked this question um, of middle school and my, my escape was hanging out with uh, my buddy who lived across the street, my buddy who lived on a farm, <laughs> which is hard to do in an area like South Maryland outside DC. But he, uh, we, we were the house of uh, the United States Department of Agriculture. So he actually lived there. We all read like the same Star Wars books was escape number one. Uh, as I'm living my tumultuous life throughout high school, trying to go to this private Catholic school, trying to really make a name for myself, I turned to Comedy Central. I would stay up late and watch the old Saturday Night Live episodes they would air at that point in time. One of my favorites being this, this Cheers reunion episode they have. Uh, <sighs> And I wish I could go into it, but I, I think Kirstie Alley is the host and they had embedded like a lot of the cast into the band. So when she does her intro, she's like, I miss the, I miss all my friends and they all come up on stage. And it's one of the most heartwarming moments uh, I think in the history of television, uh, moving to, to college and, and my later, my later high school years. And then later on in college, it was not, no longer watching comedy, but becoming comedy. I, explored stand-up classes, improv classes. I started writing a sketch comedy show, which uh, I think a few of the skips, scripts are still floating around there. I get uh, Facebook messages from people all the time. Hey, I found your old script that you gave me. I was like, oh God, I remember <laughs> how much of a kind of a hard pitch that was. I, I don't consider myself to be a natural salesman, which is like skill number three for being an entrepreneur. But I remember really like wanting people to read my, my stand or my sketch comedy script in high school. And uh, from from there on out, it was uh, like after the, after the dark time, it was, hey, hey, buddy, you look like you're going through a dark time. I hate to do the whole comparison thing, but here's what happened to me, and here's how I got out of it, and here's some steps for you to get out of it. So each, uh, each iteration provided a new defense mechanism and new coping mechanism for me. Yeah. Well, what I love about what you've done throughout your life is you really, it seems like you've gone to two different ultimate resources. One is humor, whether it's, you know, you watching and appreciating humor that someone else is using to make light of life situations that suck, or you're doing it to yourself in your own life or cultivating the talent. And then the other thing is that you're always looking at a way of like finding something good out of what happened, like your, your attitude and your, your drive to find the lesson or to see something positive like it really does show through in all of the different um, aspects of your journey and actually for me one thing that's interesting is that like growing up in high school and things you know all my friends would be we would be like in san juan in puerto rico and, and everyone would be drinking and doing all this other stuff not that i wasn't doing it but like instead of hanging out talking and doing all these different things i would be with the homeless population like I would be intrigued talking to them and really knowing about the life, what got them there and things like that. And for me, it's like they were very resourceful. I can learn so much about life and, and just how to overcome certain obstacles that they were dealing with on a daily basis. So what lessons would you say is the biggest lessons that you got from your experience? Not only from that experience, but maybe some of the other challenges that you faced. It's, a painful lesson that I'm still learning on a daily basis, but you you can't have pride in these situations. And literally, that's like a, a big liability. Uh, when when I was homeless, like just asking somebody for change is, is something I wouldn't do um, or asking somebody just for, for an opportunity is, is something I wouldn't do. I felt like I had to uh, internalize it. I felt everything had to be driven by myself. And so outsourcing is something... Uh, that I, I am more than willing to do now. I, as, I'm, as I'm getting into the podcast space and YouTube space and artificial intelligence space, I'm quickly realizing a lot, if not all of my weaknesses and the stuff that I, I can do, but it would just be way too time consuming to do. And then in a space as competitive as the entrepreneurial space, every second counts. So you really need to be able to uh, outsource those weaknesses and maximize your strengths simultaneously. That's a really important insight. And that's actually something that uh, we've struggled with 
because when you are that like so you know you're so focused on taking personal responsibility that and you get used to that that to try to put some of that responsibility elsewhere is really challenging i think that a lot of people who end up being entrepreneurs if they start out like totally independent um that's a really big hurdle so the fact that you're you know at that place where you're basically welcoming in the help is awesome because it's a really a big step um and for us i think part of the challenge and it's a challenge that you keep growing within it of being able to let go uh, because for us it's also like we have an idea we want to get it done and we want to get it done now and we'll stay up for as long as we need to just to get it done and uh, sometimes when you are outsourcing it takes a little bit more planning it takes a little bit more uh, forethought of what you want to do and how you want to create it so yeah we can't just you know do something spontaneous and pull it out of our butt like we're used to when we're working with someone else we have to be planning ahead and really thinking about what it's going to take at a higher level. Yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's the trick. My grandfather was an entrepreneur. He used to service large semi trucks. In fact, if, if you ever go to Raleigh and you see a Snapple truck, I can probably tell you what services he did to it definitely. And what services I did to it, mostly windshield wiper, fluid refills and tire pressure uh, inflation. Uh, but that's, there's, there's, a, there's just a ton of truth to that. Like you can either, do stuff all on your own and, and be agile or if you, when you have to outsource it, you have to understand that's the trade off. The agility is the trade off. Wow. You're, you're teaching me things here. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, good stuff. So, um, another thing that obviously happened along your path is there's some decisions you had to make. Um, probably some of them harder than others. Um, and so I'm just wondering if there are any distinct decision points that you found yourself in whether it's you know when you were going to college or during your homelessness experience or after the fact and then what would what was that decision point how did you approach it and like what's your how do you make those decisions what's that defining factor for you there are so many ways to map this out and i'm sorry this there's this interview can only go so long uh, I'm reminded of the t-shirts I tried to sell in college based uh, entirely on jokes, one-liners from my stand-up act. And at some point I had to say, hey, this, this thing was a failure and I put it all on a credit card. So now I have to work to pay this, this debt down, which, which led to uh, an opportunity I thought I had with a friend to, at the, at the time, sell uh, in-game currency. So uh, there's this whole industry surrounded by these huge RPGs that are online and you can sell services and items and currency for these things. And we thought we could make a pretty penny doing that. And, and it turned out not to be the case. And again, uh, <laughs> I put that all on, um, not, not money I had saved up, but money that I thought I had, which, which was not cool. So I had, uh, the, so life had to teach me twice uh, not to use money you don't have for your own enterprises. And uh, the, the harshest decision from that was, uh, can I still be friends with somebody like that? And this has led to an informed later businesses. The most recent one was this military media company that I co-owned. We made podcasts and YouTube for the military. And I thought it was fantastic. I love serving service members. I love just helping those who have sacrificed so much of their lives to, uh, keep us you know safe and uh the, the company being that we were both remote he was in nevada at nellis and i was here it became harder and harder to uh control the amount of projects we kept trying to take on and at, at the the final project was a was a youtube show dedicated to the female veteran community, which, which is great that there, there was a substantial need there. There was a market that wasn't being catered to. Nobody was making military media for female veterans or, fe or active duty female service members. That's fine. Uh, it kind of created friction for me because I'm neither female and I'm not a veteran and I'm not active duty, which begs the question of why did I co-own a military media company? I thought, and my friend thought that it'd be uh, it'd be a fun thing. We created the cool little character for me. I was the rank of E zero or E not in the in all four branches, and it was a it was just a fun project to be a part of for sure. But at some point, I'd say I I, I this has grown apart from me. I need to sell my stake, and uh, this is something that just happened last year. So finally, I was in a place where I could handle my affairs maturely. Finally, I had all the life lessons that the universe had been trying to teach me. I was able to apply and implement. And it's, it doesn't make it easier, but you know, it's business. Nothing is personal. 
Yeah. Well, I think you make uh, several good points. One of them is really one learning how to let go, you know, and that's something that we struggled with at the beginning uh, because we are avid creators and we've had other businesses and really knowing when to let some of them go. They're not really working for us or what we want to create and they're just not aligned. Instead of spending all this time, money, and energy into it saying, okay, I need to move on from this. And I think that can be very challenging. Another thing that you pointed out uh, that we have to learn as well is when you partner with someone or when you're working with someone and like really understanding that when you're getting into that business relationship, because we've launched businesses uh, with other people and then we find ourselves doing all the work or it just doesn't work out and, and like really be more selective uh, and understanding that it's almost like a marriage in some ways that, that you, you really have to know who you're working with. I, I laugh because it it, it it felt like that a lot of the time. Hey, man. <laughs> like, I guess in the, the podcasting world, editing is like the dishes. Hey, man, can can you do the editing? No. All right. Well, it's been sitting there for two weeks and somebody has to do it. It just, it just makes me laugh that you said it's like a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, I mean, really, I do think that, that, that what you said there really does bring up two important points that comes up a lot with all the people that we work with, which is one, knowing when to quit. Um, and which that can be for two different reasons. It can be either A, because it's not working, or it could just be realize this isn't for you. And then two is knowing um, who to partner with and then how to uh, successfully exit a relationship that's not working. Like this is, those are the types of like dirty parts of entrepreneurship that people don't always talk about, you know? Yeah. Everybody oh. likes the highlight reel where you end up a millionaire and nobody likes to talk about, Oh, this is the, this is, this is all the stuff I had to muck through first. What were you going to, I'm sorry, what were you going to ask? No, no, actually that's a good point. Cause a lot of people see it and they're like, Oh, you know, they create this and it seems so easy and it's easy for you. And it's successful. They don't really see a lot of times, you know, all the struggles, how many times you have to stay up all night and, and all the different things that are happening behind the scenes to just make something that seems simple work. Uh, one of the things I, I do also, I'm intrigued with and in really understanding how people deal with this is really the aspect of fear. Because obviously, when we hear you talk, you've done a lot of different things. And every time you bring, you're going to do something, there's a, a fear of something new that you're creating. There's a fear of this unknown. Like, how do you deal with that fear and just take the next step and say, well, I'm just going to do it? I will literally tell you the trick that has gotten me through everything. So everybody's probably familiar with the, the, the high dive. Have you experienced climbing up and then jumping off of a, a high dive, a high diving board at a, at a pool or a water park? And so every time I'm trying to do something new, like the, the, the human brain wants you to survive and it sees what you're trying to do as something that's not really conducive to your immediate, maybe even intermediate survival. And I have to translate whatever it is I'm doing, be it comedy, tweets, AI programming projects, I literally <laughs> envision myself <laughs> carrying something to the top of a high dive board and jumping with it. That, that is the trick that has led me this far and allowed me to survive and thrive in this environment. Is <laughs> It's so ridiculous, <laughs> but it works. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, actually, because we, we always preach the, the power of visualization and we use it ourselves but to do something like like so extreme like that it's almost like i can see how it's like well once you do it in your mind and you're like up there and you jump then it's like okay well now i kind of have to do it you know <laughs> yeah and for us actually one of the things that we used to do uh is that even if it was like cold calling because we hated cold calling or doing something that i felt uncomfortable with it's like we had certain songs and we would literally just like blast them and start dancing in the middle of the living room like baboons <laughs> and then just get it out of the system. I love that. Uh, what I wanted to bring up, but it wasn't my trick, was uh, there, there was this guy who I think slept in the AOL headquarters. He was like homeless, and he started a startup company because he found a way into this building. And he would he would work out for an hour and a half every day, and he would just like live off corporate meals. It's it's a fascinating story of a guy trying to make it in high rent in California. But uh, the, there's uh, tons of things you can do. Uh, the thing I mentioned, the thing you've mentioned, and just uh, mindfulness things in general, which is, which is huge right now, is, is keeping your mental and spiritual state uh, in tandem with uh, what you're doing and what you're passionate about. Yeah. 
and we actually use visualization quite a bit. Uh, and we tell everyone that you should really visualize to make it like concrete in your mind. Um, even when I was sick and bedridden, like we used to look at all the images of things they wanted to do and we'd sit back and visualize it. Um, and one of the crazy stories about visualization, I opened up a center in Orlando and the day before I was like visualizing like this media coming in there and interviewing us in this epic moment. And then all of a sudden we get there, our grand opening and there's no media, no nothing. And I'm like, no, no, it's going to happen. I saw it in my brain. I visualized it. It was so real. And then right when we were about to give up, the media showed up like the local newscasters and stuff. And they set up exactly how I visualized it. And it looked just like I had seen it in my mind. So good. That's some law of attraction stuff right there is the only comment I wanted to make. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. We have a laundry list of times where we have manifested some random stuff um, <laughs> yeah. from, from what we knew we wanted and what we didn't know how it was going to come. That's really where our most miraculous things have come from. It's like that. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to visualize it. And I'm just going to set the intention and believe that it's possible. Uh, without seeing the end result um, and that that's gotten us to, through so many obstacles we we've man we manifested a publishing company one time where we said you know we really want to be like hay house and then the next day we got a call from some lawyer that owned a publishing company that says hey you want to inherit my publishing company <laughs> 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 so yeah the law of attraction is, is one of those things that a lot of people hear and they think it's a bunch of woo woo crap but the truth is is that it's happening all the time whether you want to believe in it or not and so it behooves you to learn the strategies of you know expectation having a positive attitude and getting clear on what you want and then of course the biggest piece most people miss which is taking the steps and the action that you need to actually move yourself in the direction of what you've decided you want actually with that said how do you get yourself to action because obviously that's like the, the first step and, and really because you, you talk about the visualization and letting go of that fear, but then what gets you to that next point where you take action? I like to listen to the song, Push It to the Limit. And my visualization is often a, a montage of what the, the business growth should look like. So I guess I'm very theatrical and especially like cinema. I'm very cinematic about how I do it. Uh, <laughs> Well, I guess it makes sense with your, your background and what, everything that you do and you, what you've studied that um, you would bring that into it. And so another thing that a lot of people struggle with is once they become an entrepreneur and they start working independently, there's like all these challenges that you don't necessarily realize are coming or that are very different than if you're an employee. Um, and so I'm just wondering what has been the hardest part of being like completely an entrepreneur and that aspect versus when you were an employee, like what's the hardest part of that? Uh, holding somebody accountable. So as an employee, like I can say, Hey boss, this process kind of sucks. Can we do anything to improvement, improve it? And they would often, I, they would often say no, but occasionally I would, I would get the yes, but just, just some kind of focal, some kind of point of contact that I can say, Hey, I think this can be improved. Uh, well, well, heads up when, when you're an entrepreneur, when, when you are the employee, you are also the boss. So, uh, <laughs> everything you do comes on your shoulders and uh, including the decision-making I had gotten used to so many no's. I was like, okay, I guess this is the way things always need to be. Uh, but no, when you're an entrepreneur, you get to make those decisions and then you also get to do all the work with them as well, unless you outsource it. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. When you make a decision to do something and then you're immediately faced with the reality that you just gave yourself a huge laundry list of crap that you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, in the sense of responsibility too, uh, because obviously if something goes wrong, it falls on you. So that gives me the sads, but it's a reality. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a good thing because you also, um, don't have to rely on someone else. So there's one, no one there to say no, but then there's also like no one there to drag you down. You just got to, you know, step up to the plate yourself. That's correct. And, and uh, I mean, if we're thinking about this at the highest level, the, everybody goes into entrepreneurship, everybody goes into business for themselves because it's a, a huge risk and a huge reward. So these are the, these are just the, the manifestations of the, the trade-offs that we're talking about. 
Absolutely. So how do you use, I see a comedian too, and I, and I love that. Um, I've seen you stand up several times in our podcasting meetings and, and the joke of the day. You also have a podcast about the joke, uh, kid-friendly joke of the day. Um, so how do you use comedy in your own life? In my own life, uh, daily, I'm trying to write two or three jokes a day on Facebook or Twitter. And uh, most of my day starts, if, if I'm doing like a warm up, I, I start with some kind of soundtrack from a, a, from a video game. So I'll listen to five to 10 minutes from one of my favorite video games growing up. And then I'll, I'll watch five to 10 minutes of stand up or some sketch. And uh, what that does is it aligns me for the day. I think it's important and you, you might agree with me or you might have different thoughts. And that's, that's the whole point of dialogue is that uh, it gives me a routine. If I'm doing, if I have at least uh, three or four things that I can do the same every day, it can, I, it allows me to be adaptable for the things that aren't going to be the same every day as an entrepreneur. And so what humor does for me is it, uh, it mitigates my stress at the beginning. And then as I'm able to write more, it's, it's, it's connecting like my brain waves so I can be more creative and so it's, it's a twofold approach, right? You're, I'm using comedy as a way to, to de-stressify and then also as a way to em, embolden what I hope to be further innovative ideas down the line. Well, one of the things that I love that you said, and I think that it's a good lesson for anyone, is that um, you, you have like your routines, certain things that create certainty in your life, so it makes it easier to deal with uncertainty in other areas of your life. Because obviously our brain does need some structure at some level. You know, you just can't be all over the place all the time. And I think that sometimes as an entrepreneur, there's so many things happening. And it's like, you have to recognize like Natalie always does her power hour. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, every morning I take about an hour where I'm like either listening to an audio book or a podcast or watching something on YouTube or reading. Um, or journaling, something that's going to get my head in the right place um, and gives me that me time and that focus time. And then I also set my intentions. But what I like about what you said also is it's like you take the time to prime the pump, to get yourself in the right mood before you write your jokes. And I think that that's an important aspect of being an entrepreneur is recognizing you have to prime the pump. You have to get yourself in the right mode to be able to effectively do anything. Because if you just like wait to see how you feel in the moment, then when you are in that mode where you have to get stuff done, but you're not feeling it, a lot of people just end up not getting anything done. But if you already know how to get yourself in the mood you want, then it gives you the opportunity to take action when you need to, because you're not just waiting to feel motivated or like, you know, in your case, not waiting to feel, you know, like in a, a humorous mood, you're, you're putting yourself in that place using tools that you know work. Yep. So, <laughs> yep. Another question that I we use humor a lot. We're we're like totally goofy and silly, like at not, all times. Obviously, not as funny as you, but we but try. It's, just, it's the, we try not to take life too seriously. We try to make sure we're always having a good time. We're like, you know, we're the jesters um, because it keeps us able to be resilient and deal with the stress related to being an entrepreneur. If we didn't have a good attitude, we wouldn't be able to do it. Outstanding. So you were going to say something? Uh, I was going to say outstanding, and I did. Oh, I was going to say, uh, did you email me, email me and say, be there or be triangle? Because that, that, that tickled did. my phony bone. That was, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said when I'm dealing with someone else that I already know values humor, it gives me permission to say the absurd things that I normally don't um, because there's an expectation of something, I guess. But So I've also been challenging myself to let my – um, my freak flag fly. So, um, <laughs> yes, I did. I did tell him to be there or be triangle in, in our last communication. <laughs> nice. So one question I do have is like, what is your, what are other things that you do maybe to be more efficient or like stay on task or stay focused? Because those are some things that I see that a lot of people really struggle with. Oh man, so we live in the age of infinitely free tools and resources online. And if there's not a tool or resource that A is either free or B, it just doesn't exist. I will write code to make my day more efficient. Uh, just recently this weekend, I, I found my editing process to be 
tedious and repetitive. And that's when something's tedious and repetitive, it can often be written away with some simple lines of, uh, of programming code. So I, I went ahead and uh, automated my editing process. And so now, now which excites me more, to uh, be able to do things that are, that are more creative, that's, that really require focus and um, agile problem solving from your, from your head. So I think ultimately the question is, or to answer your question, why, what do I do to be more efficient and why do I do it? Uh, if, I, if I don't have to worry about the things that are tedious, then I can, I can be a superstar on the things that require uh, the things that I'm actually really good at. I love that. Automation is so much fun. Anything like, like we're like efficiency mongers. <laughs> like, like I do things like I'm constantly trying to like cut off like one click from my process of like checking email. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. I love like, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually thought about making a course at one point of like 101 ridiculous things you can do to be more efficient. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, with my video editing, um, I see now we have Victor, he does a lot of our video editing, but I used to do a lot of it. And obviously with 60 courses, you know, it takes up a lot of video. And so I would get excited. Like I tell Natty, I just figured out how to cut like three seconds from my process. <laughs> so, and, uh, and always when everything we've done is that we've always looked at how to automate things. It's almost like, how can we, as soon as we get started, it's like, how can we improve? How can we automate? And then spending that real time to really reflect. Cause at the end of the day, what we value is time. So, it's the only resource we can't create. As far as I know, I don't know if physicists have stuff, uh, discovered a way to create time, but I can't. <laughs> well, I think you can figure that one out. <laughs> yes, maybe That's, you will be the ringer that brings, the, that, the that brings it into the world. I bet it's a, there's a YouTube video that I just haven't discovered yet. Like, uh, Jimmy, just invent time travel. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> can you make we'll an online course? Yeah. Yeah. You have 30 days for that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to, I want you to think back to your younger self and imagine like that classic, if you knew then what you know now, what would be the biggest piece of advice that you would give your younger self? And you can choose the age, whether it's five, middle school, high school, college, before or after your homelessness experience, whatever it is, what would be that younger self and what would be your advice for him? Uh, and I don't know how to communicate this to my younger self. Cause I think it, it is the lifelong issue. Uh, don't, don't worry. And this, I would, I would choose the age of four. D don't worry. Yeah. You, you're wasting, you've wasted 80% of your life worrying and you could have like, in, invented you could have been a billionaire or had a, a gold statue uh, erected to yourself. I'm very vain in this scenario. Good Lord. Um, <laughs> Don't, <laughs> don't worry so much and spend time with people. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a waste of time and energy and you can be doing so many other things like coding automated processes for your friends or writing jokes or, 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 or enjoying, enjoying a, a craft beer. I don't, I don't, what, is that what the cool kids do? Craft, craft beer? Yes. <laughs> that's, that's what they do. That's what they do. Yeah. I think, I think you're, I think you're right. Well, actually, you know what I love about that is that, um, that was an insight that I kind of figured out at one point in my life, like in high school, but I couldn't really implement it yet. But I knew that that was like, that was the thing. That was what I had to figure out. So I actually had this quote that I had up on my wall and it said, the definition of wasted time is worrying about things you can't control. And like, I, I understood it intellectually at the time, but it took me years to actually be able to live it. But it, I think you're right on. Like, that is one of the biggest things that holds people back, like at any stage of life, really. Yeah. Actually, one of the songs, Don't Worry, Be Happy, is like- Bobby Farron, yay. Yeah, you know, it makes me feel good just to say it, right? <laughs> but uh, it's one of the songs I used to listen to a lot, like when I needed, you know, just that extra reminder, uh, just to put myself in the right place. And for me, I think partially is that I, I would gamify my life. So when something would happen that would worry or concern me, it's like I would say, oh, this is just a game. You just got to learn how to play it. Like whether it's a, a class or something else or doing something else. So. I love your strategy. It reminds me of how I paid down debt. I would, 
I would reward myself with twenty dollars in lottery tickets every time I paid a thousand dollars to my debt. And so, <laughs> so they did. Did they ever pay off? I. I think I was like a hundred dollars below break even by the end of it, which by the numbers isn't bad, but still obviously a waste. Uh, if you're trying to be an entrepreneur based on lottery tickets, that's not a sound strategy at all. Um, <laughs> but hey, if it made it fun, then because I love that though, like actually that sounds like a great name for a course is gamify your debt reduction. <laughs> right. There you go. Thirty days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, invent time travel and gamify <laughs> reduction. Okay, got this. Speaking of that, um, do you have any like fun projects or things that you're excited about um, or things that you're working on now that you'd like to share? I've been selected as the local resource for artificial intelligence. There's a famous YouTuber, Siraj Raval, who's been really uh, just dominating the space right now. He's a hyper genius and he, in a, in a field that, that grows, it's the in a field that grows by the minute, he's just, he's keeping pace with it. Uh, it's a, it's a marathon and a sprint at the same time. It's people running 60 miles an hour. So I, I'm, I'm his Tampa resource in a, in a school that has 800 deans across the entire world. I am still saving up for a, a sweet laptop that I can use to hopefully automate uh, some, if not all of my uh, comedy writing process, or at least make cool things. There are so many libraries and APIs right now dedicated to the cool facets of the English language that I think I can use and implement to, uh, to kind of have something build jokes for me or, or at least ideate jokes for me, which is kind of the big thing, kind of the, the biggest pain point, because <clears throat> if I can ideate jokes then I can target those jokes to, to various market segments. And that's, I guess that's kind of my approach. Can I wrote, write jokes just for uh, somebody who needs shampoo, right? And then they can deploy it to the, the 18 to 25 year old men or women that are looking for that specific kind of shampoo, I guess is the, uh, the high level <clears throat> ish, uh, the high level description of that project. And finally, uh, you know, just, just keeping up with the, the podcast network that I'm voicing on, which is less exciting. And I probably should have ended with the, the comedy automation. <laughs> well the podcast is pretty awesome too um obviously we enjoy doing it and um we've seen what you've been up to and you're doing amazingly with it so um but speaking of the the joke automation like how cool is that <laughs> like it's hard for people like us that don't understand coding uh beyond the what i learned from the course that you made um being a complete novice um but how does that work? Like, like wh where's the starting point for a project like that? That is a fantastically awesome question because comedy being subjective has so many different starting points. That's why it was so overwhelming for me to try and take it on in the first place. But the, the initial, I guess, vector or direction I would say was, was considering the way mad TV and Saturday night live kind of titled their sketches. And it, the, the, the inflection point was, the movie American Sniper. And I was like, hey, wouldn't it be funny if they just did a movie called Canadian Sniper? That seems like a thing Saturday Night Live and Mad TV would do. And then I thought, hey, why, why do I have to think about this? Can I just put in like a list of all the countries and it, it maps to like these movie titles. And from there I was like, hey, what, can I do what Weird Al does? Can I just like write a thing that, that parodies songs? And so I started researching the way like music's written and the way songwriting is, is done. And that sent me down a, a rabbit hole of an overwhelming amount of innumerable projects that can be done. So it, it really is a matter of taking one facet, one distinct facet of comedy and then, and then running with it. And my ultimate vision for this, tying it back to the school of AI is to really uh, is, is to train people hopefully on coding and comedy and say, Hey, I, I can do this one thing. Can you take care of the, uh, the thousand other ways, a thousand other modalities and styles to, to write these kinds of jokes. And so that's, that's the way, that's the way you do it. You see, you start with one thing and then you branch out from there. Well, and I guess it's the same thing with everything else in life. You know, it's being able to start with that one thing and then, kind of solidify and then branch out. Because uh, basically that's what happened with our business is where we do many other things, but 
really we had a core business of coaching and then that turned into a magazine and then that magazine spurred into like conferences and all these different things and it's like different tentacles and some of it worked, some of it did it, but it was fun. <laughs> and imagine telling your young self, Hey, build this octopus of tentacles, build this entire empire. Probably would have been overwhelming, right? It's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you're supposed to do it one piece at a time. Because if you knew how big and crazy your ideas were going to become in the long run, you probably wouldn't start. Yeah. Well, and I think that you kind of blew the mind of some people in the way that they see artificial intelligence or are listening. Because, you know, comedy is something that they would never attach to it. You know, they, they see artificial intelligence as something more rudimentary. Or cold. Or cold and not realizing that artificial intelligence can really impact every part of our society. Yes. Can I, like if I was, I was tasked with creating something that would just be me tomorrow. That's, that's next to impossible. Uh, but with enough computing power and enough understanding of the, I guess the algorithms and, and coding and underlying presets underneath it, I think we can see something within five to 10 years. We already have artificial intelligence that can, it can write songs. The, the, this, these computers can make music from scratch. A computer wrote a Beatles song and it made me cry, which most Beatles songs do. So. <laughs> that's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. And so I know you mentioned, obviously you've got other stuff going on at this um, AI comedy is your dream project. What are your current projects and like, where would someone be able to find you? Like, what are your podcasts? What would people need to search for? Is there any other place you'd want them to connect to you online? Sure, the current project, right now is to see if there's enough room in the, um, oh, what did I classify it as? The, the, the celebratory clothing uh, space. So my wife was at, my wife and her, her maid of honor, they're both going to a wedding later this year. And they were complaining about uh, dress sizes and, and dye lots. And it was a conversation that was way out of like something I wanted to listen to. I just wanted to enjoy my, my drunken noodles, but I was playing, I was sitting there playing Pokemon Go. A virtual reality augmented reality game and they were saying man it sucks that i can't tell what this dress looks like on me i'm like hey what that's something artificial intelligence can solve so really what i would like to do very the current project is to see if if somebody would be able to run with that idea um based on my understanding of uh entrepreneurial spirits i i don't have enough expertise in the uh the bride's main world or the uh the celebratory clothing line world. So I would, I would need to strategically align myself with somebody who could actually run forward with that idea, who has the access to the data sets I would need to be able to make that kind of product a reality. Ultimately down the line saying, Hey, you use your phone and you can see what this dress looks like on you in real time holographically, which is something we can do with uh, augmented reality and AI at the same time. So if, if you're out there, and you want to explore that with me, let me know. Uh, the Twitter account is at the Jimmy Murray. The Instagram account is the very professional at a wild Jimmy appeared. And you can email me at talk to Jimmy Murray at gmail.com. Nice. Well, and, and actually just talking to you, I know you have like a million ideas um, and things that it looks like just in life in general, you're looking at all possibilities and conversations and things that you stumble across. And I guess the big question is how do you decide which one you're actually going to dedicate time to? That's a cool approach. Uh, it's a, a combination of what do I feel passionate the most about uh, in relationship to how much money can this bring in or how much improvement it can bring to the world. And as I, as I am increasing, I guess my brand capital and my social capital and my financial capital, I'm finding uh, the tiebreaker often goes to the stuff that's that stuff that I'm passionate about which is not a terrible position to be in. In fact, it's a very awesome position to be in. Once, once, the, once your life is dedicated not to surviving, you can, you, you can literally do anything you want. And so uh, just do something that at the end of the day keeps you happy that you don't have to escape from. Don't, don't live a life that you have to escape from, I guess is the uh, ultimate advice and wisdom that I would give today. Amen. Preach it. Yes, yes. And so that actually is the purpose, the perfect segue to bring us into our final question, which has two parts. And that is first, what's the biggest difference that you would like your business or businesses to make in your own life? And then ultimately, second part is what's the biggest difference that you hope that what you're doing 
will make in the lives of the people that you're serving. So what is that legacy? As we've talked about optimization and efficiency, I, I and, and living in the corporate bureaucratic world, which is neither, I, I would like my mark to be that uh, things were able to get done quicker because of me. People were, weren't having to, to stay at work for eight hours a day and when they only had 15 minutes of work to do that they were able to get whatever they needed to do done and they were able to explore their lives and really find out what makes them what makes them them, what makes them unique, what gives them an identity and, and really plug in people uh, into this, this wonderful ecosystem we have in humanity. Uh, I think too, too many times we, we get caught up in the, the day to day and we, we are, uh, we're unable to fulfill our, our life purpose. I, I hear too many stories of people just like waiting till they retire to live life. Just, just do it now. Let's just do it now. Just save up enough money, uh, take the risk. If it doesn't work, you can all, jobs are always gonna be available. You can always go back to work, but again, time is the scarcest resource. So ultimately I would, I would love it if people could just be themselves and get paid at the same time. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and that, you know, that's something that truly resonates with who we are. Because at the end of the day, you know, our mission and our calling is to help people live their purpose and, and monetize their purpose. Because I think anyone can make money doing anything that they're passionate about. It's just taking those steps to really understand how to do it, finding out how to do it. So. And so what would this look like for you? So I'm assuming you would wish the same upon yourself. So being that you have gotten to the point that you're at now and you have you know, the ability to focus on your passions, where do you see it leading for yourself? This is a terrible analogy, but I immediately thought of that commercial that Matt, did you, do you guys remember that old Matt commercial where like the, the Olympic runner is like running with a torch and they, they, she bashes the, the screen in. And actually this is a terrible analogy. It's a, there's just, there's just iconic Matt commercial. I guess I, I considered myself to be this, this nationwide brand, but I do not want to be uh I don't, I don't want to be uh, conflated with that, that the big brother approach to that commercial. I, I want to be the happiness focal. I, I want to be, I think ultimately this, this lead, lends itself to what I've, I've always wanted to be like, uh, it's the, uh, it's that old Nintendo Wii strategy, uh, back in the day, back in 2007, Nintendo kind of saw that they, they had the, the cheaper system compared to, Microsoft in there, then Xbox three, I want to say it's the 360 and the PlayStation three as, as by Sony and Nintendo said, we want to be in everybody's home and then leave the competition between Microsoft and Sony. So for me, I just want to be, I guess I just want to be a part of everybody's day. Like you start your day off uh, with your, with your mug of coffee, which makes you happy. And then your, and then your screen of Jimmy, which makes you laugh. And then, and then you go about your day. <laughs> I like that. Well, you certainly make us smile and laugh. So mission accomplished on this end. Yeah. <laughs> I have no doubt that not only will you uh, work your way into the screens and hearts and minds of people all over the world, but that when you do so, that you will make their world a little bit brighter. So again, uh, we really look forward to just seeing how your journey continues to evolve and, and, uh, be a witness to it at some level. Uh, we love your energy. We love what you're doing. We love your story. And really the example that you are for other people, uh, that it is possible that you can face challenges no matter how big that challenge is, but you can define how you view that challenge and what you do with it and to really follow your passion, your purpose, and create the life that you want. And get out of that cubicle at the end of the day and live the life that you want to live. Nice. <laughs> so good stuff so so thank you thank you for being part of our podcast and for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with us and uh again uh we'll put out you know how people can reach you one more thing i don't even think that we mentioned we talked about your course how can people take your course if they're interested in learning more about coding and doing it more from a comedy side absolutely so you want to go to it's on it's featured on udemy.com and 
as I'm saying that, I realize I have a free version on YouTube that I need to take down legally. So I will go ahead and do that after the show. On Udemy.com, you want to look for Absolute Beginners Programming by Jimmy Murray. And uh, I will create a coupon code for you that you can... Uh, um, the coupon code will be... Uh, oh, what, what's the name of your show? Freedom, Freedom or Bust. That'll be the coupon code. Great. Okay. Great. <laughs> so we will share that. And I've taken the course... Um, and it was very eye-opening as far as helping me really understand what programming is and how it works. And he uses humor, of course, in his Jimmy style um, and uses an analogy of cooking to help you understand how programming works. So even if you don't want to be a programmer and if you've always wondered, like, what are these people doing to make all of this technology work? If you want to understand, it's a great way to wrap your head around uh, Jimmy's world. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Jimmy's world. Oh. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. Take care. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing how your journey unfolds. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, fellow Freedom Junkies, for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to help us grow, please rate and share this podcast. You can also become a member of Freedom Nation. Visit freedomorbustpodcast.com and sign up to receive access to exclusive content and take the 21-day happiness challenge. As you know, we believe that entrepreneurship is the ultimate form of empowerment, which is why we created the Side Hustle Business Startup Course for anyone looking to create their own income and take back their power. We offer an exclusive discount for our podcast listeners. Find out more at freedomorbustpodcast.com.